Hello, welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's a great pleasure to welcome today's program, Chris Jones, who's Executive Vice President of Industry and Services at Descartes. And today we're going to talk about the labor shortage problem, why it's bigger than you think, and how to address it. So uh, in a survey we conducted with our Indago supply chain research community back in October 2021, you know, we asked our members, you know, which parts of the physical supply chain are the most broken or be, need the most fixing? And not surprising, you know, especially at the time, um, ocean ports ranked number one, but a close second was uh, labor. And, uh, you know, simply put, you know, the demand for labor across all parts of the supply chain are far exceeding you know, uh, supply, you know, available workers out there. Um, so is this, uh, uh, you know, is the COVID pandemic the main reason, you know, for this problem or are there other factors at play? You know, what are the implications for shippers, carriers, um, logistics service providers uh, and others across the industry? And, and how can technology help alleviate, you know, this problem? Well, that's, those are going to be some of the main questions we're going to address in today's episode. And it's great to have Chris in the program to share his insights and perspective on this topic. So Chris, welcome to the program. Great, thanks Adrian, appreciate being here. And this is really a bigger subject than uh, as you're saying than probably most people really understand. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, you, you know, in many ways. So first of all, happy new year. Uh, this is our first episode of, of 2022. Uh, you know, to quote the great Yogi Berra, you know, it, it seems like deja vu all over again, you know, pandem you know the, the pandemic is still with us and, Still, you know, navigating through through those challenges, and certainly, like I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, you know, aside from ocean shipping, you know, finding labor is you know one of the biggest supply chain issues many companies are facing. But I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I know in some initial discussions we had, um, you know, I think people might have a very limited perspective of how big of a problem you know this is and what all the factors are. And, and certainly, the COVID pandemic has certainly exacerbated the problem, but. You know, is it the main cause of the problem or are there other factors at play? Well, that's a great question. I, I guess I would use the term the pandemic has masked, masked the problem that, that exists out there. You know, um, I, I just over the last couple of months have been doing some research in this space. And, um, you know, there's things that people know, uh, you know, the, the pandemic is basically did put a lot of people on the sideline. Um, uh, but, you know, when you really start looking at it, um, uh, and, and of course, there was also supplemental income, and that was really thought by a lot of folks to um, also uh, by itself just delay people from coming back into the workforce. Um, but it's really deeper than that. So maybe just I'm going to run through a bunch of numbers because I think they're pretty compelling and they kind of paint the bigger story here. So the first one is that, that the, the jobs recovery has actually been incredible. Um, the December numbers just came out to your point. We're just into the new year here. They were down at 3.9%. Uh, the month before was at 4.2. Um, the pre-pandemic number, which was 3.5%, so that was February of 2020, so literally right before it all uh, fell on us, right? Um, uh, that was the uh, lowest rate non-wartime uh, um, number. All right, so that's a phenomenal number, 3.5%. But it only, in this last decline, okay, of, of three tenths of percent, we only generated 200,000 new jobs. So there's, there's, it's, we're at a point now where we're getting uh, almost asymptotic to, you know, um, uh, where the value is, right, and what, what's happening right here. So um, that's really kind of one of the big pieces. Um, something else that, that uh, probably is pretty well known by the, uh, most people is, uh, you know, the pandemic did accelerate um, boomers retiring, um, you know, a whole bunch of reasons, uh, you know, everything from didn't want to deal with the, the fallout of the pandemic, you know, and healthcare uh, concerns and so forth, to making a fair amount of money during the pandemic, right? So uh, they left the workforce and they're not coming back, right? Um, what's also interesting about this, and just again, looking at numbers here, is job openings, right? Uh, Pre-pandemic, um, so again, right before it, um, there were 7 million job openings. Uh, and as of last fall, like last September, there were 10 million, right? So there's just a whole lot of demand for people. And, you know, it's not just supply chain. You, you walk down the street, you see stores and restaurants and you name it, everybody's looking for people, right? So um, what's also really tough is, is particularly in the areas like supply chain where you can require a lot of labor is that the shortage is actually even worse. Um, 
So for, let's say, lower skilled uh, uh, roles, um, there's actually more college level people that are out there than there are uh, for those kinds of roles, let's call them more uh, knowledge worker roles, than there are for um, the roles that normally would be um, uh, typical labor. So all kinds of stuff, all right? Um, so this is what everybody has probably mostly seen um, go on. So, but in reality, what's happened is this started a long time ago. So I have more numbers for, for people here. And this is where it gets a little crazy and, and why this is so significant and will be. So the first one is, um, uh, you know, you take a country like Japan. I, you know, pre-pandemic, I was traveling internationally quite a bit, been going to Japan for 30 years. And I can tell you that, you know, it, that's been a known thing that their population is declining. I don't know if people know how much, but between 1995 and 2050, their population will go down, working age people, 34%. That is just absolutely huge. And you go there and many people are working into their 60s, late 60s, 70s, and 80s even. Um, so that's a challenge. China's another one. Again, numbers that just came out. 2021 was the worst uh, percentage of population growth uh, in, uh, since 1949, so essentially since the communist revolution. Uh, they had a one-child policy for a long time because they were concerned about growth. Uh, 2016, they went to a two-child pol uh, policy. Last year, they went to a three-child policy. So it's a big deal, you know, and, it, and, it's, and it's global. And one, one thing I would like to do is give uh, credit to um, uh, a presentation that I saw called the demographic drought in Adrian has seen it, and uh, something you will glad to share the uh, URL to watch it because it's really eye opening. But you really have to look at uh, replacement rate uh, for births, and this is a big deal, and this is why this is so structural in nature. So replacement rate is two point one. Um, that so we got to have two point one kids per per family to, and you know, unfortunately, as you know, people don't uh, all make it right to the point of having kids. Um, to be able to replace, all right? U.S. hasn't hit that number in 50 years, all right? Today, it's at 1.7, all right? 2020 was the worst year in history. This is not great stuff in terms of growth. Um, the uh, working uh, pre, I'll call it pre, uh, uh, or younger uh, folks working uh, age is, uh, in terms of them coming up, is um, less than, so less than 22 people is, it's as low as it's been, it's been declining for 20 years. And college enrollment, if you didn't, ha hadn't heard about this one, because it's been a big issue for a while, it's down 11% since 2011. So we don't have labor, we don't have an, uh, as many educated people as we want, all right? And then, so let me just give a couple quick more facts and I'll, and I'll stop here because this is not just a US problem. All right, so I mentioned that the uh, US is at 1.7 in terms of its uh, replacement birth rate. Korea is at 0.6. Italy is at one. And most of the Western world is somewhere around where we are or maybe even slightly worse. And the, and the probably even more shocking part of it is Latin America is just dropped below the replacement rate. So that was something I don't think anybody would, would guess off the top of their head. And India is repro reproaching it. So they're still above, but they're getting close to it. So um, it's a big deal. The last point I'd make then is, you know, in the U.S., forever we solved this problem through immigration. You know, for uh, this whole 50 years, the majority of it, we've been, uh, you know, and our, we're a history of, of immigrants. So, uh, but that's really how it's happened. It's not just this administration, the previous administration, and the one before that. You can go through all of them. It's been declining in terms of uh, our ability to promote that. So. 2020 was really the worst, um, and we haven't recovered yet. You know, a lot of a lot of fast, uh, fascinating data there, and, and like you said, uh, I'll I'll share that uh, URL as well in terms of that uh, presentation that that you referenced. But it was very eye opening, and I think you know my my key takeaway, as you just kind of you know summarized there, is you know this is a global problem. It's not just a U.S. problem. Uh, it's been happening for some time, so it's not just the pandemic that kind of brought this to the surface. I mean, this has been de this has been decades, you know, in in the ma making. And I like, you know, I, I kind of said the pandemic exacerbated, but I I like your term or your perspective better. I, better, I think it has masked, 
you know, the problem, uh, it, you know, in, in some ways. And, and you're right. I mean, I know that, you know, over the past year, just looking at LinkedIn, I would, I saw so many folks that are of the, uh, let's say the baby boomer generation that were announcing, you know, their retirements. Right. right? right. So I set, definitely saw that with the, you know, the folks that I follow and, and uh, on LinkedIn and certainly saw an uptick, you, you know, in that, and I think even the, you know, the birth rate, I think a lot of folks were thinking that maybe that was, you know, we would see a spike in 2020, right? The whole, hey, everyone's at home. They've got nothing to do. You know, uh, you know, there might be uh, opportunities there for people to, uh, you know, have more kids. And, uh, you know, that didn't happen. If, if anything, it was, uh, it went in the opposite, you know, direction. So, so I think, you know, the, the, it, it's been a long-term uh, trends that have been impacting this and, and the outlook moving forward is not very positive either. So, so then the question is, Chris, I mean, what does this mean for, you know, shippers and logistics service providers and, and carriers and everyone that needs, you know, that, that needs workers? I mean, what what actions or or changes do they need to make, uh, you know, to address this problem, you know, effectively, not only kind of in the short term here, as we're talking about this right now, but, you know, in the years ahead, because, you know, the, the, the long term projections aren't positive either. Right. Well, you know, funny, Andrew, and I just say also in the whole thing around the pandemic and will we have more births? I thought it would be a combination of more more births than more divorces. So, um, uh, but but seriously, there's really I, you know there's a number of things to think about here. So let's just talk kind of strategy. Um, one is people need to rethink their whole approach to recruiting, hiring, and retention. All right, both blue and white collar workers. Um, you know, biggest thing is focus on churn and reducing churn. That is the first thing that people really need to get after and. Unfortunately, in the logistics space, particularly when you look at drivers and warehouse workers, you have very, very high churn rates. And so, if you know, if you're constantly in this mode of having to replenish, um, you know, that's that's a that's a huge problem. Let alone, and so many businesses are going through growth at this point in time. They are looking for more people than they have, right? So, keeping the ones you have is really, really important. Um, second, quick kick, uh, quick piece on this one is uh, flexibility and and how you're recruiting. Okay, so. Uh, even for highly skilled positions, because you may find you and we'll go through this a little bit more in detail, but that you need to move people around. All right. As things are going on. So if you hire somebody who's really, really good at X and they can really only do X. And when X is not as important for you, what are you going to do? Right. So the goal is to be able to move people. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, another one is alternate sources of, of workers. Right. So, um, uh, you know, this is, social integration of offenders, right? You know, so um, simply put people out of jail, people with disabilities, there's a lot of great programs around that. Uh, and in the supply chain space, people not typically associated with it. And so there's a lot more conversation around things like women drivers, right? So um, there's a lot of things that could be done there outside of the traditional space, right? Third thing is, and it really fits into all of this, which is uh, uh, training programs. So many companies have abandoned training. And I can tell you, and I started a long time ago, when I started out of college, it, I went to a company that had very big in training and internal development of people. That company had totally abandoned that. And they're not like so many others. I mean, in the sense of it's happened, right? So now you really need to look at this and target, you know, high schools and community colleges and new college grads, and, and, and it's also part of keeping them is, is skills development and career development programs. People want to do different things. They want to get better at what they do and all this stuff, and we really need to in, invest in that level. Um, the fourth one, and this is one going to be, I think, really, really important uh, strategy is, uh, I call it an evergreen productivity program which is, uh, and this is different than just efficiency. Productivity is about getting more out, out of the people you have. A lot of times when people talk about efficiency, they're thinking about like being more effective and getting rid of people. Um, here, it's gonna be about, you know, what if I got one more stop per route from my drivers? Or I, I, I was able to ship, you know, uh, 30 more orders, right? All this kind of stuff. Um, this has to be ongoing and we really have to get rid of manual and repetitive knowledge-based uh, activities and allow people to focus more on value-added services. And quite frankly, for the ones who are more on the execution side of it to allow them to be able to do more um, work, right? Uh, equally, when we're doing that though, we need to make sure that we are not creating more stress on that organization because that gets in back to that whole notion of, of uh, losing people, right? Um, 
along the same lines as the whole notion of flexing a lot of companies especially peak season have re relied on hiring masses of amounts of people holidays is a typical one right uh what are you going to do when there's not a lot of people out there to go get that are excess in the workforce um there will always be some uh, but your ability to scale we've seen companies do this particularly uh in the e-commerce space um not add literally not add any people and double their capacity over the peak season by changing their strategies and so forth and much smarter directed work and things like that right um some of the more you know uh significant ones are i hate to say this for people that, and companies that are truly global is you need to look at where you have your your uh, organ your uh operations right are you producing something in really declining uh, population countries. That's going to be a challenge. And this kind of thing, you're not going to change like tomorrow, but it's a five year, maybe even longer uh, uh, activity. You're going to start now because there's, there's just going to be more and more pressure on people uh, in those uh, areas. And particularly if you're seeing growth using the products that are produced there somewhere else. Right. Um, I think maybe two more that are out there is one is I'll call it changing the ROI uh, equation and and so like I mentioned productivity is a good example but instead of you know you should get value for freeing up and redeploying resources not just uh, automating and eliminating them right because you're going to need these extra bodies you're going to have to find ways to I'll call it manufacture them some of it's going to be hiring but a lot of it's going to be redeployment and then the last one is uh, rethink immigration uh, this one unfortunately has too many political um, uh, overtones with it but the numbers are really there. Uh, we, we need to find ways to be able to get skills at all levels into this country uh, to support the businesses that are there. Yeah, you know, the, a great list of, of uh, ideas and potential actions there. And, and I think it's one of these, uh, you know, all of the above, uh, you know, types of things that companies need to, you know, be exploring. I mean, going back to the training piece, uh, uh, same with me, you know, when I started my career, I started at Motorola and at the time, you know, Motorola had Motorola University and every employee had to take 40 hours of ongoing training and they had a huge catalog. It was, almost, it was really like a university. It had a huge course catalog and you can take anything from, you know, I was an engineer, uh, so you can take a very engineering specific classes, but you can take things like, you know, effective presentations or, you know, effective listening or, um, you know, other, you know, types of classes. Uh, and, and I think that did create, you know, some level of stickiness, if you will, because, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, you were continuously upgrading your skills and learning new things. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was a great benefit that I think a, a lot of employees, you know, appreciate it there, you know, same thing with the, with the cross training that you brought up, I, I think is going to become, you know, highly, you know, highly important. And then finally, you know, eliminating some of this waste and inefficiency that's out there, that's creating need for more labor, because there's still a lot of manual, you know, processes there. And certainly that's an area in, in transportation and logistics where, there continues to be a lot of waste and, and inefficiency, which kind of brings me to the next question, because that, that then is where kind of the realm of, of technology, com, you know, comes in. So, I mean, do you see this labor shortage problem serving as a catalyst for, you know, continued investments in, in technology? And, and how can technology help alleviate this problem? Definitely see the uh, investments going up. Actually, we do a couple of benchmark surveys. One of the ones we just did in the Florida broker space, it's not published yet, but literally I just went through the numbers last week and it's it, it's one of the top issues and and using technology as a way to get it was the, the top um, approach. And so, you know, again, there's a I'll, there's a couple of places where I think people need to think about um, in, in, a, in a broad way um, what they're going to do. So one of them is obviously this whole notion of people replacement and augmentation and, you know, robotics is you know, known as one of those, particularly in the warehouse space, um, but it can easily go beyond that. Um, and I think that that's one that people need to get after. Um, hard, hard automation has been out there forever. Literally, I started my career doing that kind of stuff. Soft automation is really where I think the opportunities are um, to, as I mentioned, things like uh, 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 directing labor, okay? Um, you still have people, you didn't replace them, but they're way more productive because you look at how to be able to, um, you know, get them focused on uh, things that are more higher value and take away from, um, you know, that that take away from their time and so forth. So, the, you know, that's a big one. Uh, really, this whole notion of focusing on higher value activity, um, 
you know, uh, I'll give you a good example. Robotic process automation is a, to me, is a great way. It gets back into the whole notion of soft automation. But I think the twists are combining it with other things like optimization technology. I mean, you know, and this gets into this whole notion. It's not just about blue collar jobs. It's about white collar and knowledge worker jobs. You know, and why does a company have, for instance, uh, 50 people to plan all, uh, all their delivery routes across the North America? You know, we've seen it where people have taken it down to literally five. All right. And what they've done is they've automated the planning process. They have their people focus on exceptions. It pretty much runs lights out. Right. Um, again, not getting rid of those 45 people, but putting them in and having them do other things that you need to do in the company. That's the big change. AI machine learning, a lot of hype around that. I think a lot of a lot of great opportunity there, uh, particularly on the machine learning side of it, um, uh, being able to, uh, again, I, I, I think of this as a white collar level thing, being able to identify trends, uh, be able to uh, spot issues, um, all this kind of stuff, exception-based work, right? Which typically would have been a knowledge worker activity. A lot of those could happen that way, right? Um, another one is putting your customer to work for you, right? So digitization of customer facing systems. I mean, this has been out there forever. I still amazed at how many people don't get what the airline industry did basically. And all of us love it. We can book online. We can do everything we want to do. We do it all for them, right? The same thing here. And in the logistics space, this is just starting. And I, you know what? I, I know a lot of logistics people not be happy with me saying this, but they, you know, I know this personally because my wife happens to be one of these people a shipper who does not want to talk to the sales guy about getting a quote, right? Wants it right now, doesn't want it in, in five days uh, and so forth. They want to do all this in a self-service fashion, right? So again, free up your people for things that are really high value. And by the way, your customers like this stuff too, okay? Another one is optimization itself for productivity and resource retention. So one, we talked about this before, getting more, like, you know, this whole more, you know, deliveries per route, uh, you know, consolidated shipments, you name it, all kinds of great stuff. Other thing about this though, is you can actually use optimization to do a better job of balancing work across your workforce. And we've had customers talk to us about how their, their drive, they keep their drivers because they're less stressed. The, the, the routes, for instance, they're running as an example for deliveries uh, are much more feasible. They're not having all this chaos that they would have had before. Um, and by the way, every day is a lot more consistent day. And as they work, uh, you know, across their workforce, right, they're able to, to balance work better. So, you know, counterintuitive to where people think about these things. Um, scaling technology. This is one we were talking about a little bit earlier in terms of peak periods. Um, how do you basically get the people you have to do, at, you know, not for maybe sustained levels, you know, all year, but parts of the year where you're, you're, you've changed your, your strategies and you're really running two, three times um, the shipments uh, with the same amount of folks. Or when you bring people in, they're instantly, um, uh, you know, highly valuable, right? Uh, this is another one. And then the last one really, but as I mentioned before about like some things you're going to need to do are more structural in nature, like moving uh, facilities or looking at, you know, uh, other kinds of uh, called supply chain strategies is it's really two things, it's global trade intelligence and supply chain design. And you need to be able to look at some new supply sources. And, and that's by the way with labor too, right? Um, and uh, how trade lanes are developing, where can I move goods based on how things are happening? And I'll give you an example, you know, Vietnam's a really uh, good one in terms of things like furniture moving to Vietnam out of China. China still produces the majority, but Vietnam is becoming a player because people have now recognized that and they realize that there is capacity there at some level, right? And the last one obviously is this repositioning. It's like, where should you put things? If you do look at where your candidates are, you do need to design your supply chain to manage those flows. And now maybe part of that process is, hey, what's the, what's the resource base gonna be for the, you know, when you make these investments these days, they're what? They're 10 to 20 years, right? So. Yeah, no, great, great, great points there. I mean, I, I like that last one. I mean, I think, you know, the, kind of paying more attention to labor availability as part of the uh, supply chain network design. Um, you know, I like, you know, when you, I think a lot of folks immediately gravitate when they think about technology, they think about kind of these robots in the warehouses, which have been going on for some time, right? But I like that you brought up kind of the soft automation uh, aspect to it as well, whether it's RPAs or just the use of optimization, the combination of these things, I think, you know, has a, has a compounding 
you know, uh, benefit uh, effect, you know, on on all of this. And, and I love the, the self-service aspect of it. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the airline example is a great one where, hey, you know, there might be things that customers um, or, or some of the other trading partners may want to do that themselves to kind of take the load off of your labor requirement. And in fact, it's actually a, a, a benefit because it's to their, um, you know, they, they prefer to do it themselves than right. have you do it on their behalf. So a lot of, a lot of great, uh, you know, insights there. Well, Chris, I mean, uh, we're running out of time here. So just as a way to kind of wrap up, I mean, do you see then, you know, labor becoming a, a competitive differentiator for companies moving forward? You know, that, that is, you know, we, we talk a lot about companies competing on, on customer experience, but, you know, are they also going to start competing on their ability to attract, hire and, and retain workers? I do. And here's the why. And this is maybe go back to the pandemic, which is the pandemic, you know, changed so much and companies that were innovative, probably even starting before the pandemic, but really in it, they're the ones that have been thriving, you know, tremendously. And innovation is all about people. It's you got to have talent. Right. And so that's that's definitely the white collar component of it. So, you know, like I mentioned, all these programs and stuff you want to get in place, um, you know, to be able to be the employer of choice, right? We talk about, uh, you know, shipper of choice. Well, how about employer of choice, right? And and the same thing on the on the on the uh, blue collar side of it. You know, the, the same things will apply there. Maybe they're motivated a little bit differently, but they're still motivated. And you know, so things you can do to make them productive, but you know, not create highly stressful situations and so forth. Or what are the things they're going to do to keep these people? And the keep is is going to be as important as hire. Yeah, again, great, great points. And I think, you know, we, we often talk about, you know, how the way we've always done things are not going to work anymore. And I think this is a prime example of the way companies have historically managed labor or thought about labor and the whole hiring, retaining, so forth. Um, they need to, to look at it now through this different lens and understand these long-term trends and, and how they're going to continue to project, you know, moving forward and, you know, adapt accordingly to, uh, you know, because this is, uh, I agree, it's, it is going to become a competitive differentiator a, a, as well. Well, Chris, you know, we, we covered a lot of ground. You provided some great data and insights and, and a lot of, you know, it's a very meaty topic that I'm sure that, you know, we'll probably want to circle back at some point down the road and, and you know, maybe get an update on some of this data and, and see how companies are, are addressing, you know, this labor shortage problem. But you provided some great, uh, you know, uh, great ideas for companies to, to get started on, on this journey. So again, thank you for making the time to be with us today. Well, thank you, Adrian. It's, uh, like you said, it's a great uh great topic and it's time for people to take a serious look at it uh, differently than than we have for unfortunately maybe decades absolutely and uh, i want to thank those of you that joined us today if you're watching this episode on demand either at the uh, descartes website or on talking logistics and you've got a question or a comment for chris you can post it there and i'm sure he'll be more than happy to respond via that medium again thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of talking logistics have a great day